Good morning, colleagues. You are kindly requested to take your seats. I call to order the informal meeting of the plenary to hear briefings from eminent scientists and academics on the sustainable solutions on the economics of water, climate conflicts and cooperation, and early warning for pandemic preparedness. Dear colleagues, <clears throat> science is a leitmotiv and cornerstone in the work and preparations of decision shapings in the GA77. Our common endeavor uh, to inform our discussions and decisions in the General Assembly continues today. Science illuminates the very foundations that our decisions are based on. Science lights up future possibilities and impasses. Science transgresses boundaries. Science helps to find compromise. Science unites. We have Aroma Revi. He is also a commissioner and director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. And Aroma is an IPCC long-term lead author and uh, yeah, also uh, in the Lancet Commission for uh, Pathfinders and he is uh, the co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Excellency, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen and my colleagues from the Commission, um, why is water important? In the 5,000 years of recorded history, the ebb and flow of civilization, the life and death of empires and nation states across the world was tied to the gifts of nature, especially the availability, reliability, and as Salman has said, the use of water to produce food, fiber, and even fuel wood. That shifted about 175 years ago when we discovered how to extract and use fossil fuels and fossil water, and apparently liberated ourselves from caring and respecting natural systems. Our populations grew from 1.5 to 8 billion in a century. The growth of human wealth, technology, and progress has seen no bounds since then. But unfortunately, that has changed. And I speak from the latest science and the evidence. The 10,000 years, the golden years of the Holocene are over. We are firmly in the Anthropocene. There is no more important proof of that than the fact that humanity has just crossed the planetary boundary on water. First, blue water, surface and groundwater, and soon, if we do not act now, green water, water in the soil for plants, trees, and even the rain. But water is important not only because of this transformation that we've seen in the global environment, because in the policy and economic worlds, it does three other things. So if you can change the slide, please. Water is one of the most important threads that connects all the SDGs, and nobody can know that better, in a sense, than the President of the General Assembly. Uh, he led this process here. So if you look at all the 17 SDGs, only three of them have a limited direct connection with water. In some senses, you could argue that even there, there's a strong connection for decent work, for industry, innovation, and infrastructure. So in a sense, water is the connector that connects all the SDGs together. Next. Water is also the key to climate resilient development, something at the IPCC that we negotiated over last year. This is just an image or projected flood risk across the world in 2050 if we do not achieve our climate goals. And the darkest numbers you see there are about 10 meters of flooding, fine? So this is very significant questions here. Climate change is not only about temperature rises, it's also in many parts of the world about dealing with water. Next slide. Water and biodiversity are also tightly coupled. You won't be able to see this very clearly, but the image is important here. This is an IPCC graph, which basically goes from a 1.5 world at the bottom to a four degree world at the top. The dark red is anywhere between 75 to 100 uh, percent biodiversity loss in terrestrial and aquatic systems. This is a very frightening thing because in a sense, water is life. We're at 1.1 degrees 
We are fairly certain if we don't act very clearly that we will reach 1.5 very quickly. Uh, most of our negotiations are taking us towards three, which is a, uh, the graph in between, the map in between, uh, third from the top. And God help us all if we get anywhere near to four. Next slide, please. So in some senses, if you bring all of these three things together, there's a large unrealized development and economic potential to use water as an organizing principle to accelerate SDG, climate, and biodiversity implementation. This, in a sense, is a mandate of the Commission to try and see how we can build this frame and try and, 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 and move this process forward. So the key thing is, as we face a grow, growing water crisis from the local to the global, too little, too much, and too polluted water, we also live in a deeply unequal and sometimes unjust world that often neglects to care for the poor and vulnerable. And one of the most immediate ways that we see this is in the access to water. This, along with the water crisis, endangers, like I've said just now, the implementation of each and every SDG by 2030. It does this especially by multiplying the challenges of food security, very obvious, we're facing it today, health and human well-being, ending poverty and reducing inequality, climate action and biodiversity, like I've shown you, achieving gender equality that we often forget, dealing with sustainable cities and communities, and enabling partnerships and trade. And I'll underline the trade question, because in the future, in a world which is food scarce, it is only a stable trade system that's actually going to enable food security, and that's actually uh, you know, trade, trade in water. So all of these together, we hope, uh, if taken in the frame of water, can preserve the peace wind within and between nations. Next slide, please. So human action, the action of us all, embedded in the current global economy, has thrown the global water cycle out of balance. This is actually, in some senses, unbelievable. But the real implication of this is that every person, every ecosystem, and every place, and this takes us to the 2030 agenda, is at risk unless this balance is restored. So this water cycle is a bridge that cuts across human divides, connects communities. It's made up of surface water, rivers, lakes, and the ice that we can see, the groundwater that we don't see, and the atmospheric moisture flows that science now enable us to see and measure. And this is a, the green water that I think is of, of a con considerable concern as far as we're concerned. The floods, the droughts, the cyclonic storms, the heat waves and fires that Thurman talked about that we are facing with increased intensity in every nation and region today, and maybe more tomorrow, are not just local crises. There is a symptom of a global and systemic water crisis closely linked to the climate and biodiversity crisis. And each of them, unfortunately, are reinforcing each other in the wrong way round. They are tied, of course, to how we produce and consume, how we govern and finance, and most important, and this is a, this is a call out to indigenous peoples of the world, what we really value. If water is life, and we actually respect and, and love life, there's a very critical question that we have to deal with there. Next slide, please. I'll just show you some quick evidence on that very quickly. So what are the challenges? Too little water. This is a global drought risk index from the IPCC looking over a 100-year period of, of the growth of, you know, of, of drought risk. Next slide. Too little water. Droughts obviously leading to water scarcity, agricultural losses, local food shortages, and wildfire. This, again, is a 30-year trend, as we're talking about. And I've just picked out a few countries uh, that have had significant impacts here, more than 10 million. Next. Too little water. Water shortages, and this, I think, is the most critical question that we have to deal with. Water shortages will cause large crop yield gaps by 2050. Uh, you can see here the large, the dark, the dark numbers there are more than 40%. Uh, yield gaps as far as agriculture is concerned. This actually means that if the science is correct, by the 2050s, there will be 500 million. I'll repeat that again. About 0.5 billion people who are at serious risk of food scarcity and hunger. This, I think, is the most critical question we need to deal with. Next. Too much water at the same time in the same places we've seen. Increasing flood risk across the world. I just show you some evidence of that. Next slide, please. Cities are flood risk hotspots. Fine. Not only flood risk that comes from local precipitation, but those of us who live through Sandy in the city know exactly what it means uh, when, when the climate shifts in significant ways. Next slide, please. There's also the challenge of dirty and polluted water. Too little water, too much water, dirty and polluted water. We know this very clearly, and this is one of our greatest scourges for young people in the world. 0.8 million people died annually uh, due to lack of access to clean drinking water and sanitation. This is one of the most critical questions that we should have addressed, but we haven't got there as yet. Next slide, please. And of course, 
something that I think we need to think about very, very deeply. There are serious trade-offs between food, energy, and water. And the reason I'm saying that is if you need to get biofuels to deal with the climate crisis, you've got to plant them. If you have to actually do carbon dioxide removal as we go beyond 1.5, you have a serious trade-off between food security, water security, soil security in many of the most vulnerable regions of the world. This is a serious question, apart from the question of food security, that I think we really have to consider effectively. This is a systemic crisis. Next slide, please. So this is the bad news in some senses, fine. But the good news is, as Thurman said, there is a suite of feasible and effective solutions to the global water crisis. The question for us is, can we bring them together in each region to enable a set of transitions towards prosperity, human well-being, and ecosystem health? And I'll show you very quickly, next slide, some evidence of how this works itself out. This is from the, from the IPCC. It looks at different schemes. Of the, the top, the top um, uh, image there is of green and blue strategies. This is what is called nature-based solutions. In many cases, you can see, uh, if you can see it very clearly, there's wetlands, there's groundwater recharge, et cetera. And then, of course, the more common gray strategies dealing with you know, pollution, storage, a whole range of other questions. We actually have to build an organized system that brings green blue and gray together, and I think that's one of the core challenges of infrastructure development over the next 20 years. Next slide, please. Now, the interesting story, of course, you can't read this, and I know it's not important to read this. This is a map that we produced from the IPCC of 30 different adaptation options in the water sector, and it maps it against different levels of warming. So it starts with 1.5, goes to 2, then 3, and 4, and we've really assessed very effectively from the science with thousands of, of, of pieces of literature here, how effective it is, and if we are not able to achieve it, what the residual impacts are. So the science can tell you, not only across the world, this is a global image, but in Africa, in, in, in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, and North America, what is actually happening and what can actually take place. So we do have a roadmap of how to put this together. Uh, the member states do need to sort of pull that together and make, make, make it work. So uh, can I go to the next slide, please? The core question for us is, the global water cycle is a global common good. Restoring the balance of the water cycle through collective action from the local to the global is in the shared interests of all nations. This is not like any other crisis in the past. This is a global crisis. It will, implant, it will impact all systems in the world, whether it's food, whether it's water, whether it's energy, uh, or anything else that we're talking about. So in some senses, uh, the UN 2030 Water Conference with the Water Action Decade provides us a critical opportunity to help restore the global water cycle within safe planetary boundaries and simultaneously accelerate and scale SDG implementation, climate action, and biodiversity conservation. So this can, of course, in a very practical way, deliver tangible benefits to communities, environments, economies, and nations across the world. We must also, and I think this is the opportunity for yourself, and I'll speak here on a personal note, eight years ago, I sat on the other side of the podium, and we presented uh, how uh, the SDGs would play itself out. And uh, the PGA at that time was the co-chair of the process here. Uh, I think the most important thing that we came from that process here was using development and the environment as an opportunity to restore and build trust in the multilateral system. So water, in some senses, is one of the core organizing principles to restore and build trust in the multilateral system, and I would commend to yourself the opportunity to do that in the next few months. Thank you very much. It's very interesting that Mr. Arumar Devi mentioned uh, civilizations and 5,000 uh, years ago. Uh, as many of you know, of course, uh, the Nile is vital for Egypt. Uh, without the Nile, there would be no Egypt, as a matter of fact. Um, I am sure many of you are also aware of the uh, extreme challenges we face with regards to water, extreme water poverty. We face extreme water poverty. We have a shortfall of about 35 billion cubic meters every year. Uh, we actually, therefore, quite appreciate the comments made about the um, science and policy uh, interface. Uh, some of the comments uh, about uh, water governance uh, that are, w w were said as a plan for the future are actually currently being implemented uh, in Egypt. We have a national plan for water, 2017 to 2037. We actually use and reuse every drop of water three times in Egypt. Uh, this is not a matter of, uh, of uh, this is not a luxury for us. This is simply a matter of, of, of necessity. Um, 
Second, I uh, appreciate also the comments about the water envoy. Uh, this is uh, an issue that uh, the establishment of this office is something that has been supported by 150 member states. Uh, we think uh, what was mentioned in the many of the briefs about how water, in fact, is the least common denominator of every single one of the SD SDGs, uh, I think, makes the uh, establishment of this new post quite uh, important. My final uh, point is actually um, a question. It's regarding the uh, uh, Global uh, Commission on the Economics of Water. We, of course, uh, value the substance uh, contained therein, but since this commission comes out of the World Economic uh, uh, Forum, my question is, would we not benefit as the general membership from a more inclusive type of, 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 of uh, not reporting, but a more inclusive type of, of uh, water uh, discussion. I thank you. You've all had the luxury of listening to the best of science and the best policymakers on an issue that is truly of global concern, and also an issue where we just do not have the luxury of time anymore. We are literally running out of time, not just for this panel, but really to deal with a water crisis that does not have the same sense of urgency as we have with climate. And I, I really hope that we can see that we have brought huge development to humanity in terms of reducing income poverty, but in the wake of that, we have changed the properties of an entire planet's atmosphere, and in the slipstream of that, we've changed the entire hydrological cycle. That's what we've done. And so, to me, now that we have science showing how connected we are as humanity on blue water, but also on green water, on water vapor, on soil moisture content, the only way to solve this is through multilateralism, is to do this together. And if I can make one plea with all of you here in this room, and I hope you have your pens ready or your notebooks, it is to draft that message to your headquarters that this is not a technical issue that we cannot engineer our way out of the water crisis, that this is a global political economy challenge, and we need leaders in the room in March. Because without leaders, we cannot have a whole-of-government approach. Without leaders, we cannot have a whole-of-society approach. Without leaders, we will fail to achieve the Paris moment of water. So please write to your headquarters, get your capitals to do what must be done, and that is to send in your leaders. Because the next time we have this, quite frankly, if I look around this room, most of us will be pushing up the daisies, provided there's enough water for that. And we just don't have time. This is literally about the lives of people, about our economy and our survival. This is a byproduct of the way we're organized, our economic institutions. And so this is the time to show that we can learn, to value, to understand, and to manage water. So thanks to the panel, thanks for all the valiant work of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water, and thank you, Tharman, for explaining that this was an initiative of the Dutch government. It is neutral, it is science-based. I don't want to politicize water, but it is a global political economy challenge, and we better start dealing with it. Thanks a lot.